good to see everyone here this morning. We, good morning, good morning. I was in Grove City, Ohio. Anybody from Ohio around here this morning? Oh man, we got a lot of them. It's better than Pittsburgh, I guess. All right. Anyway, oh yeah, I was a shot at the Steelers fans. I know, I know. Um, so, but, but it's good to see you coming from even further west than Pennsylvania. That's good. Uh, I was in Grove City, Ohio a few years back, and I went to the Church of the Nazarene in Grove City, and uh, I met a pastor there. His name is Pastor Bob Huffaker, and he told me the story of a particular Sunday where they, he got up to preach, and uh, they actually showed a video clip before the sermon of him riding a Harley Davidson through Grove City. And then as the video wound down, you could hear the roar of a Harley Davidson within the church that morning. They opened up the double doors to the, to the sanctuary, and he rode a Harley Davidson up onto the stage, cut the engine off, put the kickstand down, and then preached the sermon. And I'm looking at those doors over there this morning. <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. I'm not, this, this would not hold. But I thought about that, and uh, I thought, well, this is crazy. You know, what is he doing here, you know? And it was, a, it was a particular Sunday. They were having a biker Sunday in their church, and they invited all the different groups that rode bikes from the community into the church, and they came in, you know, wearing their, 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 uh, their colors or whatever. You, I'm, not a da- Harley da- I'm not a bike rider, so help me out here. What's, you know, the, uh, the vests and the the chaps and everything else that they ride, you know, and all the, showing all their organizations and everything. They all came that Sunday. And this was their first Sunday doing that, and so they had a tremendous response. And, of course, when they saw the pastor ride in on a Harley, this was like the highlight of the service, you know. And uh, everything was great that Sunday. And uh, it was about Wednesday of that week, because the local paper also covered that. It was about Wednesday of that week that Pastor Bob said the email started to come. And the letters started to come to his office, saying, how dare you write a Harley Davidson in the church? How dare you ride that thing into our sanctuary? But the one that really got him was, how dare you let those people in the church? You see, people were complaining because he was inviting these, quote, sinners into the church. And he was getting a lot of flack. But you know, I think Pastor Bob's in pretty good company this morning. Because there was somebody else who got a lot of flack for letting those people in the church. In fact, the parable that we heard this morning out of the Gospel of Luke, which is one of my favorite stories in the Bible... We often think of it as this prodigal story, the prodigal son, and we love it because we put ourselves in the position of who? The son that's lost, that's wandered away, and we come home and we experience God's love in our lives. But I want to read a verse to you. In the very beginning of chapter 15, it says, Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and even eats with them. So Jesus tells this parable not to lost people. Jesus doesn't tell this parable necessarily to his disciples, although they were there and probably overheard it, and that's how we have it today. Jesus told this parable to the Pharisees, to the religious leaders of his day. And I think that that's exactly what they were saying to Jesus. Jesus, how dare you let those people in your midst? You're a rabbi. You represent us. Why are you hanging out with these people? Don't you know they're unclean? Don't you know they're tax collectors? Don't you know they're sinners? Uh, I think Jesus knew. And so they're questioning him. They're writing letters and sending emails to Jesus and saying, what are you doing here? This isn't right. And it's this parable that Jesus tells to them. I noticed that the parable, you know, if you read the parable, I love the story, don't you? The story of the son going away, coming home, coming, and then dad shows this great celebration, you know, and I can hear, celebrate good times, come on, right? I've been to enough wedding receptions to know. I think that one ought to be cut from the DJ list, by the way, just a side note. 
So, you know, they're having this party, and I want the story to end there. Don't you, don't you want the story just to end there? Because that's the fairy tale ending. But Jesus doesn't stop the story there. He goes on and he begins to explain what happened with who? The older brother. Now keep in mind, who's he talking to? The Pharisees, religious leaders. And how does he end the story? The older brother. Talking about the older brother. Who, he is pointing out some things to the Pharisees about how they're behaving. (laughs) Now does the parable take on a little bit different perspective here? Because where Jesus is actually telling it to point out how the older brother behaved and saying to the Pharisees, you guys are behaving this way. This is why I'm doing this, because the father's love is extravagant. Prodigal means to be recklessly extravagant. So who in this story is recklessly extravagant? It's the father. It's not the one who went away. It's the one who was at home and through the big party. God is recklessly extravagant with God's love towards his people. And so this is what's going on here, and it's the elder brother who's having a problem with that. But you know, there's a few things that the older brother didn't do in the story. How many people here are, have a, a, a sibling? You have a brother, a sister, right? A lot of us do. And if you're an only child... That's good. You, don't, you, you didn't have this experience. <laughs> but how many of us have watched one of our siblings start to do something really dumb and go, oh, I want to watch this? <laughs> H- have we not done that? We, I'm going to step back. I'm not going to say anything because they're going to get in trouble, and I'm not. And I think that's kind of what's going on with the older brother here in this story, isn't he? Oh, this guy, my younger brother, what is he doing? He's insulting his father, actually. By going and asking dad for his share of the inheritance, he is insulting his father. He's basically saying to dad, I wish you were dead already. I wish you'd, you know, give me the inheritance now. I don't want to be under your roof anymore. I want out. But if you were paying attention to the details of the gospel lesson this morning, and I know you were, right? When the father divides the inheritance in the story, he divides it between them. So that means that not only did the younger son get his portion of the inheritance and go off and squander it and spend it, but the older brother also got his share of the inheritance and just stayed home and probably saved it and socked it away. He was the one sitting there going, hey, I'm going to let you get in trouble and I'm also going to benefit from this. So who's he thinking about here? Himself, right. He's thinking just about himself, not about his brother, not about his relationship, his dad's relationship to his brother. And I think sometimes we, like the elder brother, his problem was he was silent. He didn't say anything. I think sometimes as older brothers and sisters who we are, we are the older brothers and sisters, we're at home with God, are we not? Are we not in God's house? Are we not the older brothers and sisters today? Are we not the religious leaders today? I know I am. (laughs) That's a given, right? But all of us really are the brothers and sisters that are already at home. We're at home. And we've got brothers and sisters out there in the world who aren't home. (laughs) They don't know about God's love for them. And sometimes don't we remain silent and don't say anything? I think about my, my wife's grandfather's name's Pop-Pop, and he passed away a few years ago, and when he was in a retirement community, his wife had recently passed away, and he had moved to a retirement community, and uh, so we, we would take him to the grocery store when we'd go up to Philadelphia to visit. And he would go to his local grocery store, and you always had to go to the particular one that he wanted to go to, right? And then you got to the grocery store, and you know, he only bought like five things. You know, the necessities of life are milk, eggs bread, ice cream, and cereal, right? So those are the things, the necessities of life. And uh, so he would get his five items, and then you'd go to check out, and you'd look at the 12 items or less line, and you'd see that there's only one person there, and they don't even have a checkbook out. I mean, they're paying cash. So you know this is going to be quick, and you're going head into the 12 items or less line, and he's going, no, 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 we're not going there. I'd be like, what are you talking about? It's short, we'll get through real quick, we can get on with our day. 
And then there's another line over there, it's still short, not 12 items or less, but he doesn't want to go in that line either. And then, sure enough, you look down the end, and there's the longest line in the grocery store. And what line does Pop-Pop want to get in? The longest line in the grocery store. So we get in line, and we wait, and we chat, and he gets through the line, and you get up to the cash register, and he knows her by name. And she knows his name. And she, he, in that one minute, the cash register shares something of a word of encouragement with her and tells her a little bit about God and how God cares for her. Takes his bags and we walk out. And he says, you know, I always go to her cash register. You see, what he was doing was he was being intentional about building a relationship with somebody else that he saw on a regular basis and saying, I'm going to build a relationship with this person. I want to share my faith with this person behind the cash register. I'm not going to be complacent. I'm not going to be silent. I'm an older brother to all God's children. So he knew that. But the old, what the Pharisees were doing was they were being complacent. They were being silent. They weren't sharing God's extravagant love with those around them. Jesus came to do that, and that's part of the reason why Jesus was so popular. The other thing that's going on here that we neglect to see in the story is in first century Judaism, the person that was most responsible for any conflict or problems within the, the family was the oldest brother. Remember, anybody may remember from Sunday school the story of Joseph and his brothers beat him up, throw him in a well, and they actually are debating whether or not to kill him. And this happens, and then they sold him into slavery, but they sell him into slavery when Reuben, the older brother, is away. And so they're having this debate, or what the, and so when Reuben comes back, the brother is gone. See, he was trying to figure out a way to get Joseph out of the pit and back home to dad. But because he was gone, he wasn't able to do that and step in. So he went along with the story that his brother had been killed. But he knew that he was ultimately responsible, that he ultimately had to go home and answer to dad for what was going on with his youngest brother. It's the same thing here. The older brother is responsible, just as responsible for what's happening with the younger brother as the younger brother is. He's responsible for helping reconcile the rift in the family. This insult to his father. He should have gone to his younger brother and said, what you're doing is not right. We don't want you to leave home. We want you to stay. You need to understand. You need to be right with, with, with God, dad. You need to be in, in relationship with dad. Don't let this thing happen. But what do we have? We don't have the older brother doing that. We don't have the older brother taking responsibility for the relationship of the younger brother to the father. And that was his responsibility. I think sometimes we neglect to see that it is our responsibility as older brothers and sisters in the church to help people in their relationship with God. That's our role. I think about that, and I think about a young man who I know who has now grown kids, family, radio announcer, sports person, sports radio and he went to, came, showed up to church one Sunday for Youth Sunday. And he was coming to be the usher that morning. And this was back in the 80s, if you remember the 80s. And uh, he, showed, he came to church that morning, and he had on a blazer, and he had on a tie, and he had on some khaki pants, and he had on some Docksider shoes. Do you remember the Docksider shoes? Anybody still wearing them today? Some of you maybe even have them on out there. Yeah, that's right. And in the 80s, it was cool not to wear socks with your Docksiders, right? So he's got his tie, his jacket, his khakis on, his Docksiders on, and no socks. He reports to the head usher. Head usher looks him up and down and says, you can't usher today. You're not wearing socks. You need to go home and put some socks on and then come back and usher this morning. Well, I'm here to tell you today that that young man is still not in the church today. And one of the stories he relates to me is that story. He says, that's the day I stopped going to church. Because they were concerned, more concerned about whether or not I was wearing socks <laughs> than the fact that I was there, wanting to be in the house of God. You see, that well-meaning usher, maybe well-intentioned usher, had neglected to see that this young man had a relationship to God 
and was hurting that relationship to God. And we have to keep that in mind. I know that I've made that mistake myself sometimes as a pastor to not see that other people's relationship to God is important. We need to do that as older brothers and sisters. But the last thing is, where do we find the brother in this story? Where where is he when the party's happening? When they're singing, celebrate. I want to get you guys singing that this morning. I don't know why. (laughs) But where is he when that's happening? He's out in the fields. All right, get this. Younger brother's gone, right? He's got his share of the inheritance. He's home with dad. Dad's one day going to pass away. Who do you think is going to inherit the family business, the farm? He is. So who do you think he's thinking about? (laughs) Himself. Oh, he's thinking about himself again. And he's thinking about, he's going to, so he's going to work hard, develop the business. He's not at the party. He's out in the field. And so he misses the party because he's consumed with his father's business. I've been there. I don't know about you. I've been so busy, wrapped up sometimes in doing what I think God wants me to do or God's business that I neglect to see the other people around me that God wants to be extravagantly loving to. Anybody ever hear of annual conference in the United Methodist Church? Some of you who are... United Methodists know what I'm talking about. Those of you who are United Methodists, I won't go into all the details, but we gather every year in Baltimore, Washington, for all the clergy, all the pastors, all the laity gather together, and we vote on things and legislation, and it's like a big Congress, you know. And we debate over budgets. But one particular evening it was the first weekend of con- first night of conference. I was. Coming out of D.C., we were in downtown D.C., I was taking the red line, got on at Metro Center, I was heading out to Shady Grove. And I got on to the Metro Center and I sat down in those seats, you know, the L-shaped seats where you got leg room. And I sit in one of those seats and I'm actually, you know, facing, so I got a little leg room, I got my papers on one seat, and there's not really a whole lot of people on the train because it's later at night, and so I think there's plenty of room I can spread out, read all this, these papers I just received. And so I begin reading, and a couple stops later, someone gets on, and they start to stand there, but I thought, you know, just don't make eye contact, right? (laughs) Because if you don't make eye contact, they'll walk away. But this person didn't walk away. And I'm trying not to make eye contact, but I can see this black combat boot tapping on the floor over here. And I look over, and I see a young woman with cut-off jean shorts and a grungy green t-shirt and bright red hair and a pierced eyebrow and a pierced nose and a pierced lip with arms folded going like, are you going to move it or what? She wasn't going anywhere. And I made eye contact. (laughs) So she sits, so I move my stuff over and I kind of scrunch in the corner because at this point I'm a little scared at this point to be truthful. And so I'm sitting there and she sits there, and then she starts to look over my shoulder at what I'm reading. I mean, we're crossing all kinds of boundaries here this evening. <laughs> and, and so, you know, I'm getting a little ruffled, and she's reading over my shoulder. And then she says, are you United Methodist? And I said, yeah, I'm a pastor in the United Methodist Church. And she said, well, I saw that cross and flame thing on your letter. Then. And I said, oh, you're, are you United Methodist? And she says, well, I used to be. And I said, well, where are you from? She said, well, I'm from Oklahoma. And I'm sitting there going, where is the bonnet and the prairie dress? You know, I'm thinking. (laughs) And she's like, you know, Oklahoma. I'm like, this just is not fitting here for me. And um, she sits down and I said, well, where do you go to? Do you go to church now? She says, no, I don't go to church. I'm never going back to church. And I said to her, I said, well, tell me about it. (laughs) And uh, for the next 30 minutes, she let me have it. She just let me have it. She, she chewed me up one side and down the other. And she let me know everything that was wrong with the church and how she had been hurt by the church and how this had affected her. And to be honest with you folks, I had to agree with her. And I just listened for a half an hour. Shady Grove was coming up, but before Shady Grove was coming was Rockville and White Flint, and it was her turn to get off the train. And I had just been listening to her and asking questions, never really saying anything. But I began to see her spirit soften as I listened. And then I remember, I can still picture her grabbing the rail as she was about to get off the train and as we were coming to the stop. And 
she looked at me and she just said, thanks. And I looked at her and I didn't preach a sermon. I just said one thing. I said, do you think it was a mistake that you sat down next to me tonight on this train? And she said, no. And I said, I want you to know something. I know that you've given up on God, but I want you to know that God has not given up on you. And she got off. I think about that. I don't know what has happened in her life. I don't know where she is. I don't know what God is doing in her life. But the point is, is that sometimes I can get so consumed in God's work, what I think is God's work, that I can miss the people right next to me. And if she had not barged her way into my life, I would have never had that opportunity. Folks, there are people all around us every day who have been de-churched, unchurched, whatever we want to call it, lost. We don't even, I, don't even know, I don't even know that all those are right. They're just folks that need to know God loves them. And they're all over the place. But are we going to be like the older brothers and sisters in the parable who are out in the fields, who are just neglecting those relationships? Or are we going to be like Christ? Who hung out with them and spent time with them and reached out to them and said, God's love is extravagant and reckless. You know, our vision as a church is to help connect and root people to the life-giving message of Jesus Christ. That's our vision. We want to do that. We want to help people connect with God's love in their life. That's what we're here for. That's why we exist. Amen.